presence of everyone tonight. Uh, again, the other technology of Zoom, certainly appreciate that. And then we're in a study of Romans. And we'll start at the 10th verse of the second chapter of Romans. And it's a continuation of the previous verse. So we may back up just a bit. <clears throat> Before we get started, though, let's just have a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless this, our study of thy word. We are, are grateful for the wisdom that is contained in it and for the direction that it gives our lives and for the hope that we have in it. We pray, Father, that we may ever be not only students of that word, but proclaimers of that word to a lost and dying world. So bless us as we study, and may we ever be mindful of what Jesus had to go through in order to preserve this word for us and provide for our, our salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Back up to verse 9 for a, a moment since, uh, well, it actually begins quite a ways before that, talking about you know, the different uh, in tribulation anguish and so forth. All the uh, uh, evil things that come upon man, but it starts here with the, the uh, good things. <clears throat> he says, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. <clears throat> so to all who uh, work good, God will uh, bring, of course, as good as God defines good, will bring honor, glory, and peace. Of course, uh, as we read before, the, uh, the Jew is said to be first. He's first in punishment uh, because of the abuse of better opportunities. He's first in in terms of blessing because of the better life that uh, he has in the law of Moses. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, but there's no partiality with God. Now the two conditions set forth in verses seven through 10 are, uh, well, they're conditions, they're conditional. That is, if uh, punishment is conditional, then so is salvation. Ethnicity, social standing, uh, political affiliation, wealth, education, nationality, and so on and so on, these things do not matter. Uh, no personal preferences are shown by God. If there is no partiality, that is, uh, respect a person with God, then the Jews stand before God on the same level as the Greek, that is, that is the Gentile, Greek and Gentile are interchangeable terms as far as the Jews concerned. Uh, being a lineal descendant of uh, Abraham, circumcision, keeping the law of Moses, uh, being the nation chosen by God, could never secure the Jews salvation. Uh, the Jew, as well as the Greek, could only be saved if they were fully convinced that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, Savior of mankind. So Paul uh, sets out to prove that very point. <clears throat> In verse 12, it says, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as, as many as uh, have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. <clears throat> so the Jew and Gentile are both uh, addressed here. <clears throat> Those who sin without law, uh, of course, refers to the Gentiles. The law is, a, is an expression of someone's will, either God, some legislature, king, queen, despot, or towards those to whom are accountable persons, or persons are accountable. It could be God's formulation of what we call the laws of nature, or the law of controlling natural things, or phenomena, 
to be binding on the former, it must be made known to them in some intelligible form. In this expression of this verse, the Gentiles did not have a law such as the law of Moses. So did the Gentiles sin without law? Well, they did not have any written law such as the law of Moses, but they had to have law in some form. They had the truth at one time, that is the knowledge of God. So in the truth, they had law. <clears throat> it was in disobeying this truth that they sinned. But if one can perish without law, then one can be saved without law, which is, which is false. It must be then that without law means a written revealed law such as the Jews had. <clears throat> Since a Jew was under a, a revealed written law, they will be judged by that law which they transgress. If they are saved under the law, that is the law of Moses, it is not because the law quits them, <clears throat> it is because the grace of God through the blood of Christ releases them from the con condemnation of the law. Verse 13 says, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. The Jew heard the law, but violated it. Now, merely having law amounts to nothing. Whether Jew or Gentile, none kept the law perfectly in whatever form they had. Now, since none did, there is no justification by law. This Paul attempts to impress upon them that no that uh, one could be justified by law only if that law were kept perfectly. <clears throat> Since neither Jew nor Gentile did, the Jew must realize that there must be a, a this must be something beyond law to justify him. <clears throat> and of course, that laid open the path to the gospel. <clears throat> In verse 14, continuing, continuing verse 13, it says, For when Gentiles <coughs> who do not, do not have the law <coughs> by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves. <coughs> well, the Jews, the Gentiles had no written law from God of any kind. And by nature means without uh, a written law. It does not mean a nature wholly enlightened by divine truth. Although they did not have a written law, many of the moral duties prescribed or vices proscribed by the written law, uh, they knew to be right or wrong as the case may be. So in the beginning, at least, they loved the truth, they spoke it, they hated theft, adultery, in many other uh, moral perversions <clears throat> and avoided them. <clears throat> the further they got away from the beginning, uh, such depravities became more commonplace. Insofar as they have a correct knowledge of moral duty, those duties being set forth in the Jews written law, then they have that as a law to themselves. They cease to be a law to themselves as soon as their knowledge becomes depraved, <clears throat> which it did. And, and of course, we know that it became a custom. <clears throat> Verse 15, uh, to show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them as much. Hey, and that's kind of the the conscience that uh, Eric spoke of. <clears throat> so this uh, verse expands on the previous verse. Those who are a law to themselves are only those who show the work of the law written in their hearts. The written in their hearts is uh, metaphorical, and it signified that they knew certain things to be right 
and they felt compelled by conscience to do them. Their conscience testified that certain actions were or were not in harmony with the right. Their thoughts or consciences uh, either condemned their actions or approved them. In verse 16, it says, In the day uh, when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See, it was a continuation of the previous sentence. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, the day when God will judge the secrets is the final judgment. So every unknown act or hidden thought, at least to men, will be known and considered. On this basis, everyone will be condemned. Therefore, there is the absolute necessity of justification by faith. That is a that system of faith set forth in the gospel. God will judge the world by Christ, or more particularly, his words will judge the world, John 12, 48. Those who lived and died under the law of Moses will be judged by it. The Gentiles, according to the law written on, in their hearts, will be judged by it. And those who lived under the gospel will be judged by it. Since a general day of judgment is taught in the gospel, then there will be one. <clears throat> in verse 17, it says, Indeed, you uh, are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast um, in God. The yeah, boast is the same Greek word used in, uh, we'll see it later in uh, verses uh, 23 of chapter 2 and verse 2 of chapter 5. And then in, in uh, verse 3 of chapter 5 and also chapter uh, verse 11 of chapter 5, same word. It's either boast, glory, or rejoice. So uh, uh, the new King James Version assumes all are called to be Greek passive. You, know, you can look this up in your uh, uh, Greek text if you have. If you got an electronic deal, you, it's fairly easy to look up. But it also could be a middle voice, in which case would read, you call yourself a Jew. Uh, the fact is that the Jew was proud to be a Jew and to call themselves uh, Jews in, and in their estimation, uh, Gentiles were lowly creatures indeed. <clears throat> Uh, of course, uh, G Jesus demonstrated that a Samaritan might be a good neighbor, while a Levite, a, a Jew, might be heartless, something that did not occur to the Jew. Paul is saying that a mere name does not in and of itself demonstrate a superior excellence of life, but rather it is in actions that demonstrate that. The Jew considered himself to be favored by God simply because he had the law of Moses. Now, boasting in God is not wrong when such boast, uh, boasting is based on a, a reverence for God and a scrupulous effort to please him. Paul established the basis of boasting in Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. But the boasting of the Jew, uh, based on uh, bigotry and conceit, was a, just a sham. In verse 18, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And you might then notice that Paul has some very long sentences, and it's an interesting thing to, to uh, uh, I think we used to do it in, in English and school. They don't do it anymore where you break apart the sentences and, and show what the, each the particular clause is pointing to. Don't do that anymore. But Paul does it. He says, and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of, out of the law. So it is uh, good to know God's will, but 
the mere knowledge did not make the Jew better than the Gentile. He knew God's will, but did not obey it. Not only that, but the Jew uh, sunk to the level of the Gentile that he uh, so vehemently despised. Being instructed by the law, the Jews were in a better position than the Gentiles to identify the excellent things of the law and approve them. We read in Philippians first chapter verse 10 that you may may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ. <clears throat> in verse 19, again, it's a continuation. And are confident that you yourself are, and we can, we might just add some words in here uh, to these each of these uh, uh, descriptions here. You are a guide. Let's let's put in spirituals. Each one of these, you are a spiritual guide to the phys to the spiritual. And we're not talking about physical to the spiritual blind, a spiritual light to those who are in spiritual darkness. So those are assumed uh, qualities of those uh, nouns. So Paul speaks uh, metaphorically. Uh, the Jew considered himself to be the spiritual leader, um, for him to qualify to do so. After all, he was the seed of Abraham. If he esteemed himself qualified to lead the Gentiles out of darkness, then it is entirely reasonable to expect him to be that which uh, what he proposed to make of the Gentiles. Uh, but he was not. He goes and say uh, a, an instructor in verse 20, an instructor and his corrector in ASV, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. And the Jew considered all men uh, but himself to be ignorant. In his self aggrandizement, he considered only himself qualified to instruct the Gentile. Well, in fact, uh, this uh, should have been the case, but he was not. And this was hypocrisy in action. The Jew did not have the knowledge of the truth, but only the form of it. The old law was a shadow of the reality in forms only, not the reality itself. And therefore, it was only the schoolmaster. But having this form of knowledge and truth, the Jew should have uh, been what he clearly was not. In verse 21, we read, You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Now, this is just a truism, which we, uh, I think we all uh, recognize. In the very prax practice of teaching others, does not the things taught also teach the teacher? Well, of course it does. We recognize that. Uh, the Jews taught that a man should not steal, and rightly so. So the answer to the rhetorical question is, Yes, you do not steal. Now, this does not mean that every Jew stole. Uh, I should say the rhetorical question is, yes, you do steal. They teach others not to steal, but you do. This does, doesn't mean that every Jew stole, but it was uh, prevalent enough for Paul to ask this question, to which the Jew, uh, whether he's been honest, must answer truthfully, uh, albeit very likely silently to himself, yes, he does. But in verse 22, <clears throat> you who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And the King James Version says, dost thou commit sacrilege? The Greek, the Greek uh, means a, a temple robber. That's talking about robbing temples. We'll have to talk about this in a moment. So here's the same species of uh, hypocrisy talked about in verse 21. 
uh, the Jew would preach to the Gentile that he should not engage in, in, in adultery, uh, yet does so himself. And that doesn't mean everyone did, but it was prevalent enough. Um, now, the Jew may have done it with more sophistication and subtlety, but it's still, it is what it is. So after the return from the exile, uh, the Jew uh, never engaged in the worship of idols again. So worship of idols is to set aside the laws and the worship of God, which the Jew did. To rob a temple is to commit sacrilege and to take to one's private use what is consecrated to God, which the Jew did. Now, a temple, a pagan temple, holds idols. So in doing the things that the, uh, the Jews did, committing sacrilege and, uh, you know, converting to private use, what was uh, concentrated to God. Jews were robbing the idols from the temples to worship them. So rather than the actual robbery of the temple, the Jews may have been importing the law, unlawful worship of idols, uh, or the, at least the pattern of idol worship from the nations around them. It, this doesn't mean they were actually robbing things from the, the tabernacle. <clears throat> so in verse 23, it says, you who make your boast, uh, and the ASV says, you who glorious in the law, do you honor, uh, dishonor God through the, break, uh, the breaking of the law? While the Jew did a lot of boasting of their relationship to the law, and their obedience to in support of it, they dishonored their alleged allegiance to it by disobeying it. Furthermore, they dishonored the giver of the law, God, by breaking the law that he gave. The ways they dishonored God were noted in verses uh, 21 and 22. So one guilty of such uh, uh, actions loses the moral standing to judge another doing the same thing. So the uh, Jew had no place to criticize the Gentile. In verse 24, it says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now, the, uh, the Gentile would uh, reason in this way. If the Jews are like this, uh, you know, blaspheming their own God, then their God must be like our God as well. So today, uh, we may judge a man's religion by his life, but that's not the way God does it. The heathen judged the man's God by his conduct. Uh, when they saw hypocrisy, practiced by the Jew in the name of his God. Naturally, the heathen thought of the God of the Jews as an arbitrary and capricious God like theirs. It was a blasphemous to think of God in this way, but th that is the way the Jew portrayed him to the heathen Gentile. So it was uh, naturally for the Gentile to think this. Uh, Christianity uh, must, of course, be judged on its merits, that is, how it is disclosed in the New Testament and not on the basis of the abuses ascribed to it. In verse 25, <clears throat> it's for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So Paul selected uh, circumcision as his, his example since the Jew considered this right more than anything else as confirmation of his special relationship to God. So what Paul is saying is that uh, the value of, of uh, circumcision is contingent. <clears throat> of course, this was a foreign concept of the Jew. Circumcision does have value, that is, if one keeps the law that authorizes it. If the circumcised Jew does not keep the law, then circumcision has no value, nor does descent from Abraham. 
everything depends on keeping the law perfectly. The same principle uh, principle holds true under the gospel, except that there is atonement for sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Belief is invalid without repentance. <clears throat> repentance is of no account without belief. Confession is specious without repentance. And baptism is merely a removal of the flesh without confession. Uh, each step to be efficacious is dependent on its antecedent. Verse 26, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements for the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? If the Jew breaks the law, doesn't his circumcision become uncircumcision? What value? We see from verse 25 that indeed it does become an uncircumcision. That being the case, <clears throat> if the Gentile keeps the requirements of the law, does that count as circumcision? The implication is uh, yes, it does. <clears throat> <clears throat> of course, the Gentile was never required to be uh, circumcised, while the Jew was. But the fact remains that the Jew was in no better position than the Gentile if he broke the law, which he did with regularity. <clears throat> in verse uh, 27, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor, a transgressor of the law. <clears throat> now, this is a hypothetical uh, question because neither a Jew nor a Gentile kept the law perfectly. But the logic is valid. It's, it's a valid uh, hypothesis. The Jew had the written law, which uh, prescribed circumcision. If the Jew violated the law and was thus condemned by it, of what value was circumcision? There was none. But if the Gentile fulfilled the law except for circumcision, will not his obedient judge the transgression Jew? Yes, it will. Now keep in mind that neither kept the law perfectly. <clears throat> that's, that's what makes this hypothetical. In verse 28, for he is uh, not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So verse 28 and uh, 29 following, uh, they flow logically from what has already been said. A, a circumcised Jew was indeed a Jew, but he was not a saved Jew if he relied on his keeping law of Moses, which included circumcision. In verse uh, 29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. The inward man is uh, one of the spirit and heart, poor in spirit and pure in heart. Uh, such uh, seek praise from God, not men. For example, in Luke, the 18th chapter, verse uh, Verses 10 through 14, we read thus. Two men went up in the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He wasn't praying to God. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners and just adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, uh, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The tax collector was poor in spirit and pure in heart. 
that is the one that will be will abide in God. Paul says in Colossians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 12, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Of course, here Paul begins to lay the groundwork uh, for the gospel. And we go on into uh, the uh, third chapter. <clears throat> now, what advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision? If the Jew and the Gentiles are both in sin and under condemnation, then this is a question that the Jew uh, may reasonably ask and should answer. Well, Paul answers it uh, for him, said much uh, in every way, chiefly because to them uh, were committed the oracles of God. Uh, much in every way that he had not already excluded by the preceding verses, the Jew had many advantages not available to the Gentile, but his advantages were contingent contingent. If used properly, they were a blessing. If not, a curse. The oracles of God, that is the whole law, came from God and were committed to the Jews. Next to the gospel, the law of Moses was the greatest revelation to mankind. The benefit to mankind that these revelations had was inestimable. Of course, the uh, gospel was even greater. In Romans 15, 4, uh, talking about the old law, for whatever things were written for, were written for our learning. That we through, uh, this means King James says, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, it should read that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In uh, verse 3, it says, well, what if some did not believe? Would their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? <clears throat> God confided his revelation to the Jews, but they were not faithful to the revelations and trusted to them. Did that unfaithfulness on the part of the Jews permit God to avoid or ignore his promises to them? Well, the answer to this is in verse 4, emphatically, certainly not. Or got to be it in the King James Version in ASV. Uh, God is not in the Greek, but is uh, certainly implied. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. This is a strong, unconditional denial of the question in verse 3. In no circumstances will God's fidelity fail. At all times and in all circumstances, God is true and every man is false. As Paul writes later in the uh, 23rd verse of this chapter, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In that sense, every man is a liar. All men have proved fallible. God never can be. The latter part of this verse is from uh, Psalms, the 50, the 50, 51st Psalm, verses 1 through 4, particularly the fourth verse. The wording appears a little different because the Romans, the Roman verse, uh, is taken from the Greek Septuagint and not the Hebrew. And he reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. <clears throat> For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Of course, you recognize this is David. Uh, begging forgiveness for the sin of Bathsheba. 
says that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I think the Hebrews, uh, at least to me anyway, seems a little bit clearer. When God speaks, his words will be found to be true and he will be found blameless in his judgments. His words are true and his judgments are correct. In verse five, <clears throat> but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? He says, I'm speaking as a man. If man's sin is the means for God to demonstrate his plan of righteousness through the gospel, uh, shall we conclude that God is being unjust in punishing the sinner for living in such a manner as to allow God to display his righteousness? In speaking as a man, Paul is speaking from the perspective of the, of the objector. Of course, the answer to that is, uh, no, he's not being unrighteous. Somewhat similar to what uh, uh, Paul wrote in, and this is somewhat similar to what Paul wrote in, in the, the sixth chapter of Romans, for, uh, verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And of course, we know there that it says absolutely not. <clears throat> so God is going to judge uh, sin as sin, uh, regardless of what it demonstrates. God has made two promises uh, to the Jews, both of which he kept. He promised to bless them if they kept his statutes, and he promised to punish them if they didn't. And he was true to both promises. Of course, his answer in verse 6 is certainly not, but God forbid, for, how, for then how will God judge the world? Uh, to the preceding question, uh, Paul answers, God forbid, it, or be it not so. If God could uh, not reward faithfulness and punish sin, how could he ever judge the world? It was an absurdity to think otherwise. Verse 7, for the, if the truth of God has increased in my life to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? <clears throat> so in, in attempting to expose the false reasoning of the Jews, Paul uses himself to illustrate the point. Paul was held to be <clears throat> a uh, traitor to the religion of his fathers. <clears throat> That's why the Judaizing teachers followed him around. And was considered by the Jews to be a sinner. <clears throat> But he says, if my unrighteousness, according to uh, Paul, demonstrates the righteousness of God, then God is glorified by my unrighteousness. Likewise, if you justify your sins on the ground that your sins brought out and displayed God's righteousness, righteousness, why am I, why am I not justified by the sin, as you said, of embracing Christianity? So Paul is talking to the uh, Judaizers. Why do you condemn me? According to your reasoning, you should not uh, be punished, nor should I. So it is the case that uh, Paul's reasoning and the Jews' reasoning cannot both be right. One has to be wrong. <clears throat> and uh, we are at the... Uh, appropriate stopping point, so I will stop here and we'll begin uh, verse 8 of chapter 3 uh, next week. Thank you for your kind attention.